And I'm Gabe. Welcome to tonight's face-to-face -face event. Tonight we have the privilege of hearing from Elder Rasband of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, our General Young Women President, Sister Oscarson, and our General Young Men President, Brother Owen. It is so great to have the three of you here. Thanks so much for joining us for our worldwide mutual event. Thank you. Thank you. You know, we're so excited to be with you two. Kayla, Gabe, thank you for being our youth host for this evening, and we're excited to join all of the youth of the church, all over the world, uh, for this wonderful face-to-face -face event. We want you all to know that we've read hundreds and hundreds of questions. <laughs> and I want to congratulate all of you who wrote in questions. They were great, they were courageous, they were bold, and we're excited tonight to answer a few of them and share with you the love we have for you and the love for Jesus Christ. So thank you. We're looking forward to the evening. Thank you so much. We would also like to recognize Sister Razvan seated in our audience with her teenage grandchildren. We're broadcasting live from the newly renovated Church History Museum in Salt Lake City. Joining us is a mutual group from New Zealand. Welcome. Kia ora. Hi. <laughs> we also have youth with us from the beautiful country of Argentina. Hola chicos, ¿cómo están? Gracias por estar con nosotros hoy. And we are so glad that you are joining us from all around the world. We want you to know that you can be a part of this event by asking your own questions. You can ask these questions anytime throughout the broadcast on face2face.lds.org. You can also post them on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter using the hashtag LDSFace2Face. Two face. That's the number two. Well, we'd like to begin with an opening prayer offered by Juan Carlos in Argentina. Uh, si quieres hacer la oración, por favor. <laughs> we would also like to begin by having a song by Kylie Shaper. She will be singing Press Forward, one of the songs from this year's mutual theme album. Kylie, before you begin, I'm sure there's a lot of youth throughout the church that don't really know about the youth theme album, what it's produced for, and what your role in it was. Would you just take a minute before you sing and tell us about that? Is it okay yeah. if we have an opening prayer real quick? Sure, whatever you wish. <laughs> All right. <laughs> si pueden hacer la oración, por favor. There we go. Nuestro Padre Celestial, te damos gracias por este momento que podemos tener. Gracias por este gran momento que podamos compartir. Ayuda para que todas las preguntas que tengamos se puedan responder y para que podamos disfrutar de un maravilloso momento espiritual. Bendiciones a cada uno de nosotros y es que podamos sentir el Espíritu y apreciar mejor el momento. Y esto lo decimos en nombre de Jesucristo. Amén. Amen. 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 Gracias. All right. So every year when a new mutual theme is announced, a new mutual theme album is produced, and all of the songs on this album are written by youth, and you can find them for free on youth.lds.org and on music streaming platforms. And my role on the album was I wrote a song with Nick Day and Mallory Ward called That's How I'll Be. And I also performed the acoustic version of um, the theme song, Press Forward, which is what we are going to be performing for you tonight. So. Let's hear it, Kylie. Kylie will be accompanied by Dylan Montaneres, Brianna Gibson, Gabe Montesino, and Nick Day. <coughs> we go but 
That was beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> really good job. Thank you very much. Well, are you three ready to answer some questions? Let's get going. Absolutely, let's yeah. go. Awesome. Our first question, Elder Rasband, uh, comes. So, Elder Rasband, this is your first. Uh, this is the first time most of us have had to hear from you since you were sustained in general conference, and we're receiving a lot of questions about what it's like to receive your call. For example, Hannah from Utah asks, how did you feel when you were called into the Quorum of the Twelve? How can we overcome our fears of accomplishing something that God wants us to do and press forward like in this year's theme? And Melody in South Korea asks, how do we as youth accept callings that may seem too hard for us to accept? Thank you, Gabe. And I want to thank Hannah and Melody for those terrific questions. Let me just say to all of you that I can understand your concern about accepting a calling, as I have just been through quite an experience with the president of the church, our dear prophet, President Thomas S. Monson. I thought I would share you just a little bit of that experience tonight. Uh, I was called to go down and meet with the First Presidency on the Tuesday before General Conference. And as I went in and sat with them, I was very grateful that they each gave me a tender hug and an embrace and made me feel just very special in their presence. And then President Monson looked very directly at me and said these words, Brother Rasband, we want to call you to serve in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. And I want you to know that this calling comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, at that point, I was stunned and speechless. And the only thing I could really say to President Monson was, well, President, I'm completely overwhelmed by this calling. And President Monson, in his loving way, said to me, Brother Rasband, just know that we've all been overwhelmed by it for all these years. So I think that's a good model to answer this question, is maybe when any of us are called to a 
position in the church, we all feel a little bit terrified about it in the beginning. But in reality, what we need to remember is it's actually a great builder of one's confidence because the person who's calling us has confidence in us that we can fulfill the assignment and fulfill the calling. And so you should actually view a calling in the church as a great privilege and honor that others would feel so inclined to ask you and to ask me to serve in our callings. I also take great comfort in what President Monson said, he whom God calls, or she, God qualifies. And so that gave me a lot of courage to go forward, knowing that uh, as inadequate as I felt, that Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ would help to qualify me for this position. Now, I think this leads us into our theme. And so for those of you that have scriptures, I'd like you to join me for just a minute. The rest of you just make a note of this so you know where to go and to look. This is in 2 Nephi chapter 31, verse 20. And I want to read this with you and point out something about how we get answers to questions. Wherefore, ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ, and endureth to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. Now, the words I draw your attention to beyond the first words, which are the theme, having steadfastness in, in Christ, are feasting upon the word of Christ. Let me give you an example. After President Monson extended that call to me, I immediately went home to tell Sister Rasband. She was the only person I was instructed that I could tell. I told her, we began to weep a little bit together, and we knelt down in prayer, and a passage of scripture came to my mind as I was beginning to feel very inadequate about being able to fill this calling. And it was this, from John chapter 15, verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you to go forth and bring forth fruit. That passage of scripture, those words of Christ, relieved my anxiety almost immediately. And that's why I want to draw all of your attention tonight to not only the first part of the theme, which is you must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, but also that part of our effort to answer these questions for you, for me, is to feast upon the word of Christ. That's how I would answer these questions. Thank you. Thank that's you very great. much. Thank you. Sister Oscar saying our second question is for you. Okay. Samantha from Wisconsin asked, I, she says, I have low self-esteem and sometimes feel out of place. What can I do to better accept myself? And similarly, Daniel on the youth activity site says, I get bullied and teased a lot at school. How can I see myself as God does and get a more long-term perspective on my life? Now, those are great questions from Samantha and Daniel. And um, they're not alone in feeling the way that they do. I think a lot of youth struggle with with their feelings of self-worth. And I prefer that term over self-esteem because I think it's, it's more reflective of, of the answer to their question. And that is, where do you find your validation in life? So, so often we're exposed to things on Instagram and Facebook and that's where we're drawing our cues from about how we feel about ourselves, or maybe even from those around us. But the real source that we should turn to to find out our value is our Heavenly Father. And I think, for me, the thing that gives me the greatest comfort is knowing who I am. You know, every single week, our young women stand up and repeat the, the young women theme, and they say, we are daughters of a Heavenly Father who loves us. And yet, I wonder if we really have that in our hearts, um, because if we really understood that we are literal sons and daughters of Heavenly Father, I don't think we would ever question our value again. He loves us, just like a father here on earth loves his children, our Heavenly Father loves us with um, even more power, and, and that should give us power. Um, 
So I think the answer to that question is to remember who we are and to think about the fact that we are cherished and that he has a plan for us and that he wants us to succeed. He didn't send us here to fail. And um, I think the greatest evidence that Heavenly Father loves each one of us is that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth to suffer and die for our sins. And that should give us just an, even an inkling of the value we have in our Heavenly Father's eyes, that he would send his son to do that for us. He must love us beyond our comprehension to understand that. We are of infinite value to him. That's great. Wow, thank you so much. Beautiful, thank you. beautiful, thank you. Brother Owen, yes. a lot of youth are struggling when their <clears throat> friends begin to make wrong decisions. Angela from Texas asks, how can I not feel so alone when I know those around me may, uh, have so many different standards and I know I can't do the things they do? Well, thanks, Gabe. <clears throat> Angela, that's a wonderful question. You know, I've thought about when we're young. It seems like when we're little children, little children are alive in Christ. And we don't seem to have all of these temptations. And then we hit uh, teenage years, like you, and all of a sudden, it seems like the world opens up to us. And we have a lot of challenges coming at us. And I remember going through this. It, it's just vivid in my mind. And maybe I can just share that experience with you quickly. I remember as a young 14-year-old boy, I had had friends growing up. And we were all good boys. And when we turned 14, I remember my friends started drinking and smoking. And it was a real challenge for me to be with my friends because I felt when I was with my friends, I had to defend my parents because my parents were noticing this. When I was with my parents, I felt like I had to defend my friends. Well, one night in the summer when I was 14, it was late at night, I probably should have been home, but I was walking down a road with these four friends and they started drinking and smoking. And I just felt so uncomfortable and so I just walked to the other side of the road. My four friends on this side and me alone on this side. And as we walked down, they began to make fun of me and calling me a goody-goody. You won't be our friend much longer. I got to the end of that road and they turned left and I turned right and walked all the way home by myself in the dark. And I went home and went to bed and when I got up in the morning, you might have thought that I would feel really good about that wonderful decision I had made. I felt lousy. I felt so alone. I felt like I don't have any friends anymore. What am, I, what am I going to do? You know, for several days, I remember feeling that loneliness and some emptiness, but I was prayerful, and I knew that I had made the right decision. My mother, noticing that something was wrong with me, called the mother of another friend who was a really good boy and asked if I could come and spend the weekend with him. So I went and spent the weekend with them, and we formed a fast friendship. Now these other friends, I still saw them in school through the years, and we played on sports team, and I still associated with them, but this friend influenced me for good, and I hopefully influenced him for good. We went through high school together. We went on missions at the same time. We came home from our missions, went and became college roommates. We played ball together. We married at about the same time. It was wonderful. When I was 26, I was about 26 years old, about 12 years after that experience, I got a phone call from one of those friends that was walking down the road with me. He was calling to tell me he had stopped smoking. And he said, I wish I would have made better decisions when I was younger. As alone as I felt when I was 14, walking down that road and for the days after, it paled in comparison in comparison to the joy that I felt in my life at that point. Life had become very bright. Now, how did that happen? When I think of this theme scripture that we're talking about, pressing forward with a steadfastness in Christ and a perfect brightness of hope and feasting upon the words of Christ, as Elder Rasban has said, that is what helped me and motivated me. That faith was action. And now I was able to look back and see all of those blessings. So faith really does precede the miracle. Beautiful story. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for that story. It's beautiful. 
Well, we're now going to take a question from New Zealand. So if you have a question for any of our guests, just raise your hand, and Elder Razban will pick someone. Oh. Oh, wow. Oh. OK, <laughs> we're going to pick that cute little girl on the front row in the green sweater. <laughs> Tell us your name. Hi, my name's Sophie. Sophie, welcome. And my question is, how can I stand up for what's right without offending my anonymous friends? Would you repeat it one more time, please, Sophie? Oh, yeah. <laughs> How can I stand for what's right without offending my non-member friends? Thank you. Well, I think she just got a good answer to that from you, didn't she? <laughs> she did. You know, I, what a great question. That's much like the question that I just answered. But. Uh, you have non-member friends. You know, my friends, were, they were members of the church. And they had started making poor decisions. If you can just be a great example, the way you live your life, you may feel alone, and they may not understand you at the time, right now. But over time, they'll see your good works. And so just be a great example. Be example of the believers. And you are a believer, I can tell. It's a great question, Sophie. Thank you very much. Can, can I just add oh, something please, well, to yes. that too, Sophie? Um, I was the only girl, LDS girl in my high school when I was in high school. And um, I think what helped me answer questions and kind of be different was just to own it, to be joyful in my beliefs and be proud of what I was. And that goes a long way towards um, having other people accept it. If you kind of own who you are and what you are, and and just stand up for that cheerfully, um, people tend to accept that and respect that. So that's, that would be my answer, too. Good answers. Yeah. Thank you so much. Our next question is for uh, Sister Oscarson. Uh, Emmy from Germany asks, I don't, like, uh, I don't feel like I'm receiving answers to my prayers or even feeling the spirit when I pray. When I feel that I do receive an answer, I doubt if it's from Heavenly Father or if it's my own thoughts. What am I doing wrong? And Leonardo from Brazil asks, how can I learn to hear the whisperings of the spirits? Boy, Leonardo and Emmy, those are great questions and something that all of us need to learn. Um, how do we determine whether something's our own thought or coming from the spirit? And um, actually, there's a really great scripture that I love. Every time I get towards the end of the Book of Mormon, I think, wow, that, that scripture is kind of a key to a lot of answers. So if, let me see if I can find it here. It's in Moroni. And it's in chapter 7, and I think it's about verse um, 16. So if I can read this, this kind of gives us a, a key to this. For behold, the Spirit of Christ is given to every man, that he may know good from evil. Wherefore I show unto you the way to judge. For every good thing which inviteth to do good, and to persuade to believe in Christ, is sent forth by the power and gift of Christ. Wherefore, ye may know with a perfect knowledge, it is of God. Isn't that a great um, clue for how we know if something um, comes from the Spirit or from us? If, if it persuades us to do good, if it persuades us to believe in Christ, it's good. It comes from, from God. It's the Spirit. Um, I was reading the other day a, a really good talk by Elder Boyd K. Packer. He, he talked a lot about how young people, he talked to young people a lot about how to distinguish how to hear the promptings of the Spirit. And um, he gave some great clues, too. He said it's a very sensitive communication and that we need to be doing our part. He said, first of all, we need to ask. We need to be praying. So I assume that we're doing that anyway if we're asking a question. But he said, we also need to be listening to the right music, need to be keeping the word of wisdom. These are all things that can deaden our, our ability to hear the Spirit. But we need to be worthy. We need to be pure and clean, reading our scriptures. Um, and then he said, you need to recognize that the Spirit can talk to us in different ways. Sometimes it comes, well, there's a scripture that talks about in your heart and in your mind. And to me, that says it can come as maybe a thought that goes, comes into your mind, or it can come as a feeling. Um, so if we start to recognize these different ways, um, then I think, I think we can proceed that we're, that we're being led. And sometimes it'll be very clear. Sometimes you get a clear thought in your head. 
And sometimes it's just a good feeling, and so you just kind of have to move forward and trust that if you're doing your part on all of these things, the Lord's not going to let you go too far down the road without giving you corrections. Um, it's not always going to be clear. He wants us to work at it a little bit, and we have to do our part for it. But um, I can promise you that that's one of the greatest spiritual abilities that you can learn to develop in your life is listening to the Spirit. It's the greatest gift we have, the gift of the Holy Ghost when we're baptized. And I know that as you act upon the small promptings you get, that you'll get better at it. I think I've gotten better at listening to the Spirit the older I've gotten. And as I act upon the things that I'm given, then he's going to give me more. So you just keep pressing forward. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Elder Razband, yes. our next question is for you. Okay. This is an example of a question that we're receiving the most of tonight. So this is from McKenna in Arizona, and she asks, every Sunday at church, I become uplifted and strengthened by the Spirit. I tell myself that I'll be more confident in what I believe. But throughout the week, I go to school, and I seem to lose that confidence. And I felt because of the pressure and bad environments surround me. Um, how can I do better and at not letting outside influences take over that peace and confidence that I get on Sunday from the gospel? Thank you. And thank you to McKenna. What a great question. These are all such good questions. Thank you for pondering them and thinking about them and asking them. Well, I would start with McKenna and say you've got a couple of things going for you to help you in this process. One of them is, remember, when you were baptized, you all were confirmed and given what? The gift of the Holy Ghost, to be your constant companion. Second, as McKenna said, she was at church on Sunday. Well, at church on Sunday, we partake of the sacrament. And at the end of the sacrament prayer, we're given a promise that we will always have His Spirit to be with us. And so you must remember, as you go through your daily battles in life, that you've been given the gift of the Holy Ghost to be your constant companion, and that you're making covenants every week in the sacrament where Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ are promising you if you'll do your part of the sacrament prayer, they will bless you to always have the Lord's Spirit with you. So as you leave Sunday and you go into your week, you are going to face trials. You are going to face challenges. And what I've always felt is you need to nourish that spirit. You need to nourish your spirit to be able to have those promptings you just mentioned from the Holy Ghost. How do you nourish your spirits? You take time to read the scriptures. It doesn't have to be a lot. It just has to be done. You have to make a very solid commitment that you're going to spend some time reading the scriptures. And secondly, you go before Heavenly Father in humble prayer and you ask Him to bless you to withstand the efforts of the adversary in whatever way they may come upon you and to be a strong, faithful, Latter-day Saint youth. My experience in life is that knowing that you have the Holy Ghost as your companion, knowing that you're making this special covenant on Sundays in sacrament meeting, in the holy ordinance of the sacrament, and then nourishing your spirit during the week with scripture study and with prayer will give you a tremendous defense against those things that would bring you down during the week. That would be my answer to McKenna. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. And our next question is for you, Brother Owen. We're getting a lot of questions like this one from people preparing to go on missions. Um, Angel from Puerto Rico asks, what is the biggest advice you can give to youth who are preparing for a mission? Well, gracias, Angel, from Puerto <laughs> Rico. That's a great question. <clears throat> you know, I think the first thing I'd probably say to that is go to section four of the Doctrine and Covenants. There's a great passage in there that says, if you have desires to serve God, you're called to the work. So one of the greatest things anyone can do to prepare for a mission would be to gain that desire. I guess the question then is, how do you gain that desire? Later in that, it says what you need to do to be qualified 
Faith, hope, charity, and love with an eye single to the glory of God is what qualifies you for the work. One of the things I think someone who is preparing for a mission needs to do is, Elder Bednar has taught this a lot, become a missionary before you go on a mission. Don't just go on a mission, I'm going on a mission, but, but prepare and become a missionary now in your youth. That doesn't mean that you need to wear a white shirt and a tie and have a name tag or a dress, but what you need to do is prepare so that you can talk to people. So maybe here's three quick suggestions that I'd share with you. The first one is learn how to talk to someone and listen. In Preach My Gospel, it says talk to everyone, but it, you can't just talk to everyone. You have to listen to what they're saying or you're not going to know how to respond. So engaging people in a conversation and get rid of the cell phones every once in a while and start talking in a face to face setting like we're doing right now. And really engage them in a conversation. And you know what happens when you engage someone in a conversation is you begin to understand them. Because when you become a missionary, we teach people, not lessons. Another thing that I would suggest is we have to learn to take something, like if you read Doctrine and Covenants section four or section 50, another great section. We can't just read it and let it stay up here in our head. It has to sink deep into our heart so that you can understand what someone who is learning about the church might be feeling so that you can sense the Spirit. Recognize the Spirit. It's, it's, it's very, very important that you and your youth now, that's one of the ways to become a missionary, is be sensitive to the Spirit and then follow it. And then here's just another practical one that I would think of is get a job <laughs> in your youth and work for someone possibly other than your parents you might have the risk of getting fired. That could be tough. But what you learn is responsibility so that when you get out in the mission field, when things are hard, you know how to do hard things. And you work through them instead of getting out of problems. You work through your difficulties. Now, all of this that we're talking about, the most important part is to understand that you have to be guided by the Spirit Elder Rasban has just talked about this, how important it is to have the Holy Ghost as our constant companion. So we have to develop our faith. We have to repent when needed. And, and all of us have to repent. And then be clean. Partake of the sac sacrament and ponder, ponder, ponder on the things that you're learning and feeling and reading, and you will be an effective missionary. Can I add a thought to that one? Yeah. It's interesting that all three of us up here served as mission president and mission president companion. Sweden, was it? Sweden. Mm -hmm. California, which one? Arcadia. Arcadia. New York City, New York, right here. And so we have such a love for missionaries. I remember, may I just add one Absolutely. addition to your excellent list? Uh, when new missionaries arrived in the New York City mission, we would interview every one of them, one by one. I'm sure you did the same thing in your missions. And I would ask them this one question. I would say, elder or sister, why did you come on a mission? And you wouldn't believe the variance in responses that I got to that question. Some of the missionaries would say, well, we have a tradition in our family, and I'm the 18th grandson to go in this family. Another one would say, well, to be honest, President Rasband, my girlfriend, really wanted me to go on this mission. <laughs> Others would say, uh, I'm here because I love the Lord. And I would go, that's it. That's the reason you come on a mission. Now, we accepted them all. And those who gave me one of these offbeat answers, I would say, let me make you a promise that by the time you finish this mission, you'll know the reason you came was to serve your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And because you love him so much, you are willing to give these years of your life to build up his kingdom and establish his church. 
And so if I were to give those of you who are considering missions an additional challenge to Brother Owens, it would be learn to love the Savior before you go on your mission. And then you will desire in your heart to serve him with all your heart, might, mind, and strength. Wow, thank you very much. That's perfect. Thank you. Our next question will come from Argentina. Si tienen preguntas, por favor, uh, levanten la mano y Elder Rasband nos escogerá. Uh, you can choose someone. Okay, let me see. I've got to see these beautiful young people. Let's go to that uh, second boy over on the second row. To the left? On the left side there. Okay. Raise your hand. A la izquierda, segunda fila. Yeah, sí. Sí. that boy. Yes. Sí. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and Gabe, let's get his name, too. Uh, por favor, di el nombre y después pregunte Ivan. su pregunta. Ivan. His name's Ivan. Okay. Okay. Listo. Bueno, mi pregunta es, ¿cómo podemos ayudar a un familiar que, que no está yendo a la iglesia? Pero, tipo, pero no insistiéndole, sino que sepa que, se, que, lo, am, que lo amamos Okay, gracias. So he wants to know uh, how we can help members of our family uh, come to church and let them know that they are loved and that church is something important that they should be attending. Beautiful question. Was it Ivan? Yeah, Ivan. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Sister Oscarson, would you like to try answering that question? Are you talking about non-member family members, maybe? Está hablando de miembros o oh, miembros de su familia. Que son miembros. Okay, yes, members. Members Me of your members. family. Okay. Yeah, members of family. And, and the question is, how do we make them feel? How? ¿Puedo repetir la pregunta? <laughs> <laughs> Just to clarify. Ah, eh, es, es familiar que no va a la iglesia, pero que es miembro. Oh, okay. Okay. So he has a member of his family that is a member of the church, but isn't assist, uh, like attending church. He wants to know how he can like reach out and help them come back to church. Well, I think the best way it kind of goes back to missionary work. One of the best ways to uh, we can't make other people do anything. We can't. We're only responsible for our own attitudes and feelings towards things, but we can love family members. We can set a good example for them. We can influence them by serving them and being patient and loving with them. And above and beyond that, people have their agency. But I think love overcomes a lot of things. And we're promised that uh, as we exercise love like Jesus Christ had for others, that it will have an impact on them. And I can't think of a better way to invite someone to come than just to love them and to set a good example yourself. Can I just add something to that? <clears throat> I. Th I think that, uh, and there are a lot of part member families out there, uh, but never give up. Just don't ever give up and, and love them. It just, I think it's so important that we remember we're a family and have an eternal perspective. If you just have an eternal perspective and understand that families go forever, and that gives us that desire to really want to reach out and be patient, have the long view. Don't be so short-sighted on things. Have a long view of this this whole thing, it goes on for eternity. Wow, thank you very much. Before you leave that, let me just take us back to our scripture again, okay? In 2 Nephi, the verse we read, I like what both of my companions have said tonight about love, and that's included in our verse, just again. And a love of God and of all men. Love precedes everything. You think of Jesus Christ, you think of love. Um, so when you have these somewhat difficult challenges in your family or in your school or with your friends, always remember before you make a comment, before you draw a conclusion, before you become judgmental, think of how first you can love them. Once you have that foundation of love, you'll be amazed at how you're inspired to take the next step.
Beautiful. A really good follow-up question that we've received tonight comes from Natalie in Utah. And she says there are a lot of times when she feels like her house is so full of contention that it's going to burst. She asks, what can I do to help my family let go and be happier around each other? Well, there's been times in all of our families where we've experienced some contention. And heaven knows there's contention a bit with missionaries out in the mission field. And one of the lessons we learn is contention chases away the spirit of the Lord. In a missionary companionship, a missionary who might be contentious toward his companion and vice versa, they drive the spirit out of their companionship. Same thing in a home. What we have to be is we have to be the same shining example of love and example. And my young friends, it spreads. It's contagious. Love and example are contagious. And other people will catch your love and they will catch your example. And you can help to change an environment by being loving being understanding and not judgmental and be an example of one of the believers. And Heavenly Father can work with through you to be a great miracle for others, even in your own family, amongst those who love you the most. Wow, thank you. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, you know, I have a phrase that comes into my mind. I, I love the last, I love the book of Moroni. Can you tell? I keep going yes. back. To, he, he uses the phrase, and I think it's actually his father, Mormon, who talks about the peaceable followers of Christ. And I love that phrase, peaceable followers. And when you find yourself in a situation that's full of contention, if you could think of yourself as a peaceable follower, um, that does put, it's like oil on water. It calms things, and it calms those around you. And uh, again, we can't change how others act, but we can change how we react to situations and how we act. So That's great. Well, Rasband, if I could just well, say please. something on that. I think of a scripture that uh, we all want peace. In fact, somebody before this uh, session said, if you could teach us what world peace is, that would be the greatest thing. <laughs> well, there's a great scripture in Doctrine and Covenant that says, learn of me, listen to my words, and walk in the meekness of my spirit and you shall have peace in me. It draws us back to the Savior again. If we really want to get rid of contention, then we act like Christ. So we learn of him, who he is, and, and then we begin to walk. So we have to listen to his words, and then we do as he has done. And he's our greatest example. If we think of his life and any contentious moment that he could have had in fighting and he didn't do that. So he's our great example for that. I think if we will learn of him and listen to his words and, and then walk as he did, we'll have peace in him. Wow. Beautiful. I know in my family, uh, whenever we fight, uh, my mom starts belting out when there's love at home. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Does it work? Yeah, it works. Good. See, there you go. Hymns. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Savannah in Canada wants to know, uh, she says, we are often busy with church callings, education, family responsibilities, etc. It sometimes seems impossible to have quality time for yourself and the Lord. How can we know if we have our life balance and we are giving the right amount of attention to the important things? Tell me her name again. Her name is Savannah. Savannah, that is a tremendous question. And I will tell you, Savannah, I hope you're watching right now, our whole life we have that dilemma. You're having it now as you face these different challenges. But haven't you two experienced that your whole life? Absolutely. I know, I know we have, Sister Rasband and I, as you go on in your careers, as you go on in, in balancing all of these demands in your life. And one of the great lessons that I learned early in my life is that as you have those morning prayers with Heavenly Father, you invite Him to be your partner through the Spirit of the Lord in helping to give you balance to your life. There are some days when you're preparing for an exam, you're going to have to devote your whole attention to studying for that exam. There are some days when you're the president of a Laurel class and you've got to conduct the evening mutual that you've got to devote some time to thinking about how you're going to do that. And if you start your day asking Heavenly Father to help you balance the different demands you have on your life, 
uh, include that in your prayers. Include the request, Heavenly Father, please help me today. I've got this, I've got this, I've got this. Help me know how best to manage my life today. And then, as you listen to the promptings of the Holy Ghost that we talked about earlier, you'll be amazed how Heavenly Father will be your partner through the Holy Ghost that you're promised will be your constant companion to help you find balance in your life. But there's never going to be a time when you feel you have a perfect balance. We're, right. we're always struggling with this issue, so I advise you learn how to face it early in your life. That's great. Other thoughts? I have a thought on that. Please. Just thinking of Helaman 5.12, that in this balance in our lives, that Christ has to really be the foundation. It's interesting that when we get spiritually out of tune, how everything else in our life can get out of whack too, especially as members of, as members of this church. Because we've been baptized, we've received the gift of the Holy Ghost, and when we offend the Spirit, then everything else kind of gets out of balance. So we always need to remember to follow the Savior and have Him as the foundation of everything that we do. I, I love Elder Oaks talk about good, better, and best. And sometimes we have to make choices about what things we're going to get involved in. And if we find ourselves neglecting family home evening and mutual night and some things that are going to nourish, or nourish us spiritually, then maybe we have to let go of some things that are good to choose something better. And, and you have to ask yourself, what has eternal value in my life? What's going to lead me to have the greatest happiness in life? And maybe you have to cut out some activities that are drawing you away from doing those things that nourish you spiritually. Because I can promise you the things that will be most fulfilling in your life in the long run are those things which have eternal value. That's some really, really great advice. So we have another question that comes from Jane in West Virginia. She asks and says, I strive to be married in the temple one day, which is, I think, a goal that a lot of youth in our church have. I hope all of our youth have that goal. <laughs> so, yeah. Me too. <laughs> But the more and more that she goes about her life, she's noticing close family and friends' marriages falling apart. What can she do to ensure a successful marriage for all eternity? Tell me her name again. Her name is Jane. Jane, what a tremendous question. I think all three of us ought to respond to this one. Um, I would say to Jane that as important as the church makes missionary service sound. In terms of your eternal progression, nothing is more important than for all of you to set a goal on attending the temple and ultimately being sealed there for time and all eternity with your companion. That ensures your eternal salvation in the highest degree of Heavenly Father's kingdom. So that ought to suggest that if that's the highest goal, if eternal life is the greatest blessing, we ought to make sure what we're doing in our lives is working towards that goal, working towards a temple experience and a temple ceiling. Now, you can do that now by doing baptisms for the dead. You can do that as families. You can do it as a youth groups. And you can go and get the feeling of the temple and being worthy to go to the temple right now. And I hope you're all doing that. That way you don't have to just look to the temple in the future. You can experience it now. And, and I know there are many of you around the world who are listening to this tonight. You may not live exactly close to a temple. But you can get the temple spirit by doing family history work. This is called the spirit of Elijah. It's a spirit that broods in us to care for our departed ancestors. And especially for your age group, where it's so much computer driven now, wherever you live in the world, if you have access to a computer or a mobile device, even a computer at your building, you can go and become researchers of your own family line and prepare names that can go to the temple of your own ancestors. And I will tell you, as you do that, you will develop such a love 
to your ancestors. And there's some of you in our studio audience here tonight that are nodding yes, you've done this. You know this creates a bond with your ancestors and you want to go to the temple to have them have that experience. So to prepare for the temple, I'd like to invite you all to engage in the temple. Don't wait for some future day. Engage now and develop your love for the temple long before you ever have to go there for your highest blessings and for the privilege of being sealed for time and all eternity with your eternal companion. Elder Rasband, I think I'd add to that. I'm thinking as you were talking about how important relationships are and eternal relationships. I'm at the age now where I'm looking forward and I'm looking backwards. Here we have some of our grandchildren here tonight, and my heart turns to them. But my heart has also turned to my grandparents who are gone. And so I'm in a wonderful time of life to be able to see this eternal family. And the desire to want to be with them comes from the temple and being in the temple and understanding the doctrine of an eternal family. So I think when we, again, we have that eternal perspective and we can look down the line at our children and grandchildren, we can up, up the line, even those that have gone before us, they have a huge impact on our lives. They truly do. And I know that's real. I, I love what you said about the eternal nature of, of marriage. And I think that's the difference between a lot of marriages that, that you maybe view in the world, is that often marriage is viewed as something, well, if, it, if it's inconvenient or it doesn't fit my um, what I want to do with my life, then we can always just get a divorce. Um, we don't view marriage like that, do we? Um, we see it as something that is eternal, that when you prepare for marriage, it's going to be forever. And so that puts, a, that puts um, some responsibility on you to be the kind of person who, number one, is worthy and ready to go to the temple for that kind of commitment, but you're going to be looking for someone who shares the same values you do. And, and if you both have the same values and are same, both have your eyes on the Savior and serving Him through your whole life, you have a much better prospect of having an eternal marriage. That's, that's what our goal is. And if we can kind of keep that as our, as our model and example, then I think, I think we'll be okay. Thank you. Can, can I, I add advice? something? Of course. Um, when I was first called to be a general authority, by President Gordon B. Hinckley. And when he called me into his office to be set apart as a 70, he laid his hands upon my head and I was prepared for him to ordain me a 70. That's what I'd been called for. I was unprepared when President Hinckley said this to me with his hands upon my head. Brother Rasban, I bestow upon you the sealing power of God to be used in all the temples of the world to bind on earth and have bound in heaven. I was startled with that. I, I didn't quite know that in my call to be a 70, I would receive the sealing power of God, which is a very, very sacred authority. The highest authority of the Melchizedek priesthood is the sealing power. And now for these years that I've been sealing members of my own family and others, uh, many of our return missionaries and their sweet companions, I have repeated to them a statement that President Hinckley also taught me about the importance of that day. So imagine a day in the future that you and your eternal companion go to the house of the Lord and kneel at a sacred altar. President Hinckley said about that day, the day that a couple kneel across the altar in the sacred house of the Lord becomes the most important day of their life. Number one. Now all of you are going to have many important days in your life. Your baptisms, missionary service perhaps, even your endowment in the temple. But President Hinckley said that the most important day of your life is the day that you're sealed to a companion in the house of the Lord. Why? Because on that day, you create a new eternal 
family. And that's the connection of the past and the future is the connection that you'll all have to create and start your own eternal family. What an incredible, worthy goal for all of you to have is to plan, live, prepare, be worthy of the day that you can go to that temple and be sealed for time and all eternity. Thanks. I think a good follow-up question for that that I know many of the youth have fears about is raising children in a world that is so corrupt and that is changing for the worse quickly. And how could we not be so fearful of the future and raising a family in this kind of situation? Well, that's a very good question, too. Yeah, it is. Do you want to take a stab I'll, at I'll it? I'll take a stab okay. at it. <laughs> um, I think the key to raising children in a wicked world, and it is out there, I think as parents, you know, sometimes you must be scared to let your kids go out the door, um, is to create a haven within your home, to make your home a place that, um, that puts the shield and the, you know, the, the armor of God on them so that when they walk out that door, they're protected. It's in the home where, where we teach the children to, um, to be strong and to withstand temptation and what's right and what's wrong. So um, take advantage. If you live in a, in a home where you're being taught the truths of the gospel, um, that's your sanctuary. And that's your protection for when you walk out into the world. Remember the values that you've been taught. If, you don't, if you're not blessed to live in a home where you're being taught the principles, principles of the gospel, um, you can be doing it on your own. You can be studying your scriptures and praying and fortifying yourself and being prepared for some day to create the kind of home that you would like to have. But um, the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ is our protection against the, the sins of the world. And we just need to put on that armor of God that it talks about in Ephesians. Thank you very much. Great. Beautiful. May Thanks. I add a thought to that? Of course. Um, sitting in the audience here tonight are some of my grandchildren. And I remember when one of their parents came to their mother and father and said, Dad, are we safe to have children in the world that we live in today? They were really nervous, and some of their children are here tonight. And I remember Sister Asben and I looking at them, and the only thing that I would add to what Sister Oscarson said is there's, there are holy places that we can count on to have protection for our families. The home, A number one. A number one. Secondly, Believe it or not, your wards and your stakes that you're all a part of. Your branches, if you're out in the distant mission field, we've been promised that they also are defenses against the storm here in the latter day. And third, what do you think I'm going to say for the third holy place? The temple. You think of those three places, holy ground, sacred ground, your home, your wards, branches, and stakes, which are a defense from the world on the outside and the house of the Lord. And I remember us bearing testimony to our daughter and her husband that if she could ensure that her family was focused on standing in holy places, that she should, be, uh, she should have the courage to go forward and have children. And now they've been able to bring seven of our beautiful grandchildren into this world. So, anything you'd like to add? You know, just a scripture came to my mind as you were talking about these holy places and the temple and everything, and I think of the waters of Mormon where people came to know their Redeemer, and yet it was in a wicked land. There were beasts, and it was in a very wicked place. But that spot was very, very sacred. So wherever we live in the world, we can have the stakes, our homes, the temples, in very wicked places. But there we can come to know our Redeemer. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Perfect. Our next question will come from our studio audience. How exciting. <laughs> Anyone questions, just raise your hand. Questions? You know, I've been looking at you all night, sister. How about you stand up and tell us your name and, and what your question is? I'm Janessa Jacobson, or Janessa, from Utah. And my question is. How can I, as a young woman today, prepare to be a mother? 
well, I think there's only one up here who's qualified <laughs> to right. answer that question. Right. We're going to have to give that one okay, to you. Okay, well, I, please feel free to jump in because you've both had mothers. Yes, you, you know. that's true. How can I prepare to be a mother? Well, um, number one, we looked at Jesus Christ. He sets the example for us in all things, and even he's the perfect example for both men and women. And you look at the attributes that Christ had and exemplified, and, and that's, those are the attributes a mother needs, too. But I think we also have um, great role models around us. Look to your own mother and see what qualities she has that have helped you become the good person you are. And look to your grandparents. Look to your grandmothers. And then look to your young women leaders. Look to your bishop's wife. There are some great role models around you in your home and in the church that can teach you how to be a, how to be a good mother someday. And at the basis of it all is Christ-like behavior. Sister Oscarson, how many children do you and your husband have? We have seven. And we have 28 grandchildren. So I think you win the award for tonight. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> OK. Well, we're going to take another question from New Zealand now. So raise your hands if you have a question. New Zealand. Well, let's go over here to this sister on the right-hand side. Front row. Yes. Tell us your name, please. Hi, I'm Foa. Foa? Am I Christian? Yes. When we are resurrected, will our body be the same age when we died? For example, will those who died in childhood rise as children? Well, that's a good doctrinal question. You're very steeped oh, in, right? <laughs> I defer to you on that one, Miller Rasmus. Well, I think the right answer for that is it precisely has not been revealed to us yet. Did you hear what I said? Yeah, I, I mean, several of the leaders of the church over the years have opined on that question, but I, I wouldn't know where to turn unless someone could help me to a scripture or something that could give you a absolutely scriptural, doctrinal answer to that. And I think that that's a good lesson for all of you. You don't always also have to have the answer to a question when you're asked a question. I'll tell you one thing I'm going to do is study that a little bit more. <laughs> and if I can give you a better answer, I'll get back to you. And I'll give you a better answer. But sometimes you might be confronted by one of your friends with a question that in the moment you don't have the foggiest idea how to answer. You can always say, I don't know, but I will do my best to try and find out. And that's my answer tonight. <laughs> OK? Maybe we can have one more question. OK? okay? You choose where you want it to come from. Um, Argentina. OK. Yeah. All right. Argentina, si quieren preguntar otra pregunta, levanten las manos. Go ahead, choose someone. Uh, I have to get up so I can see them. How about that sister on the right-hand side there, on the second row? La hermana a la derecha, segunda fila. OK, that's OK. OK. <laughs> ¿Cómo podemos ir adelante cuando pasamos por momentos de aflicción y dolor? ¿Cómo nosotros podemos ir para adelante a pesar de estar en esa situación? Ok, gracias. Uh, ¿Y cuál era su nombre? Tania. Talia. Tania. Talia. 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 So, she wants to know, how can we press forward when we're going through hard times in our lives and there's like struggles and things that are happening to us personally, how can we like find that drive to push forward? Good question. Brother Owens is going to answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when I think of this wonderful vision that Lehi had, we think of this theme scripture, pressing forward with a perfect, this brightness of hope. And uh, I, I really believe that if they can 
read that scripture, if you'll read that scripture, and if all the youth will read that scripture and let that go from your head into your heart, you'll, you'll get your answer, and you'll, you'll know what to do. Uh, I, I really believe that. I think that uh, Zelda Rasband has said there's so many questions that uh, we, we would like to be able to answer, but I think one of the greatest things that we could teach you this evening is you need to follow the promptings of the Holy Ghost. Be in the scriptures. So in that, in that dream that he had, that vision, holding f fast to the rod of iron. Be in the scriptures and ponder them, reflect on them over and over again. You know, you think of Joseph Smith and that prayer that he gave leading up to that. He pondered, he reflected over and over again. There's a pattern of that with people that receive answers. So I think I'd give that answer to that. Very good. Thought? Well, I, I think we, we have to realize that life is going to have its ups and downs and that sometimes they're going to be difficult. Um, and that's what that scripture is all about, like you say, is, is that when times are difficult, when you're going through a hard time, that we stay steadfast, that we still hold to the values and the beliefs and keep our eye on the Savior, and things will get better if we do that. And so it takes faith. It takes faith to keep walking and moving forward and, and proceeding with faith. Okay. And so I, you know, I think that scripture is a great answer for it. Things are going to be hard sometimes, and things are going to be great sometimes. And that's a part of this life experience. So we just stay faithful through the hard times. Thank you very much. That's perfect. I cannot believe how fast the time has flown by. Neither can I. Thank you so much, Sister Oscarson, Elder Rasband, Brother Owen. I have learned so much tonight, and I'm certain that the youth of the church have too. Thank so you. Thank you. Thank we have you. one more song to hear, and then if Elder Rasband, if you'd like to give any concluding thoughts, that'd be okay? I'd be honored. Thank you. Thank you. So this next song, Savior, Redeemer of My Soul, will be performed by Dallin Henry, Nathan Hill, and they will be accompanied by the Gibson sisters, Brianna, Leandra, Michaela, and Janessa. While the song is being performed, we will see images of the new Church History Museum exhibit. We will also see church videos that show how saints in the past have pressed forward with a steadfastness in Christ. We hope this song will help you remember how you, like saints throughout church history, can press forward, relying on the Savior. After the song and Elder Rasband's closing remarks, we will have a prayer from New Zealand. I read. 
dream by night Then let my lips proclaim it still And all my life reflect Thy Wow, thank you very, very much. The feeling we're all feeling right now is the Spirit of the Lord. You've asked yourself sometimes, how do I know? What do I feel? Well, just ask yourself what you're feeling right now. And you help bring that to us. Thank you very much. Well, my young friends, I'm joined now by my wife, Sister Razban, and in grandchildren and members of our family and I want you all to know that this is my youth advisory council <laughs> and the reason I say this is so that all of you know that the leaders of this church are no strangers to your issues and to your concerns and to your challenges we have children we have grandchildren we're out often meeting with youth all over the world and we're praying for you. We're talking about you in the most sacred places. And we love you. And we're so grateful that you would invest your time to send in so many questions from all over the world. As you've seen, we've not even scratched the surface of all the questions that have been asked. And I want you to know that every one of your questions is important. And every one of your questions can be and should be answered. And so now I'm going to give you a challenge tonight, all of you. You need to think of someone, a trusted friend, a parent or parents, grandparent, teacher, Bishop Brick, advisor, even a trusted friend. And you need to get these questions answered. And you must remember, from the very beginning of our face-to-face -face tonight, Jesus Christ is at the heart of the answer to every one of your questions. Now, we want this conversation to continue. And so after this meeting, this face-to-face -face privilege of meeting with all of you, we're going to continue to answer questions. 
We're going to go up in a room and get on computers and live answer questions, and we'd love to hear your responses, your feelings about tonight. And this is going to continue for a couple of weeks. Ourselves and a team that we've assembled are going to continue to keep this going and try to answer as many questions as we possibly can. But I want you to remember the challenge that you've received tonight to try and take these outstanding and very important questions to someone who can answer them for you in the spirit of prayer and humbly seeking the direction of the Lord. Will you do that? Thank you. Now I want to conclude by just saying a few words about testimony. I want you to know that President Monson, his counselors, the 12 apostles and the leaders of this church love you immensely. I can only imagine the love that Heavenly Father and our Savior have for you is so great and so complete. But I want you to know that we love you and we're concerned about you. And I bring you the love of our dear prophet, President Monson. He is such a loving president of the church. His whole life has been b built on loving people and helping lift the downtrodden, the fatherless, the widows. He truly loves people. And I imagine that that's a gift that Heavenly Father has given him that's a great attribute we know, the, the prime attribute of our Savior Jesus Christ. I, if I could look at every one of you one by one tonight, and all of you that are out in our many congregations and looking over computer screens and however you've joined us, I want to share my testimony with you. I know that Jesus Christ lives. I know that he is our living Savior. I know that he presides at the head of this church. I love him. And I know that he loves every one of you, person by person, one by one. May God bless you all to feel the peace that comes through knowing Jesus Christ. May God bless you that you will have your questions answered and that you'll set your sights on those events in the temple that we've talked about tonight, that you can go forward and with your families, current and future, build up the church of Jesus Christ and add glory to his name. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Oh dear, Father in heaven, we're so grateful, Father, for this wonderful moment as we come together as thy children to witness the wonderful messages that was given by other residents and sister Nelda. We thank thee, Father, for these many blessings that thou bless us with. We come before thee, Father, to please bless all the youth around the world and those who are watching this so that they'll be able to use these messages and help them throughout life and their future goals so that they may be able to achieve what they have been asked for. Father, we ask thee for thy blessings upon our prophet Thomas S. Monson and his counselors, the 12 apostles and uh, the 70s. Father, we ask thee for blessings upon all our leaders of the church. And we say this prayer humbly in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.